morning, everyone. When I was 18, I met a mother, Haya, and her four-year-old daughter, Rana, at a center for Palestinian children with disabilities. They planned to spend three weeks there, learning about Rana's autism diagnosis. This was heartening, until Haya informed me that when she returned to her community, she planned to hide her daughter in her home. She told me she would rather not have friends than have friends who knew her daughter was autistic. I stayed in touch with Haya after I returned home. I was conscious that if her family experienced such stigma and lack of resources, that Rana was kept out of sight, there must be others in the same situation. Eventually, motivated by this knowledge, I founded a small organization to train parents and offer support to families in their community. This, over time, grew into a global voice for autism. To date, we have helped more than 18,000 children, teachers, families, and community advocates in refugee and conflict-affected areas build and participate in more inclusive communities. We help children like Rana come out of the shadows. Mental health is integral to the well-being of children with disabilities and their caregivers. So we offer community events, support groups, and training to caregivers to reduce their stress levels and increase their ownership of children's developmental outcomes. We also improve children's ability to communicate their wants and needs, whether verbally, by pointing, or by using sign language. With our help, many children speak their first words. And their brothers, sisters, and families become comfortable spending time with them as a whole family in community spaces. We find that brothers and sisters of children like Rana also need support, both to be confident in themselves and to be supportive siblings. Many are asked to hide the fact that they even have a brother or sister with autism, and we help lift the burden of that secret. We bring different families together so that all the brothers and sisters can mix with their autistic siblings too, and realize they are not alone as they support each other. We also work with teachers who want to include children with disabilities in their classrooms. And, of course, with mothers like Haya, who long for both knowledge and community. Working at the intersection of two populations that are among the world's most marginalized when it comes to health equity, people with disabilities and refugees, is not easy, but it has revealed some important lessons that must be considered in conversations about health equity. First, measurement is key. Most interventions for children with disabilities are US-led and have only been tested on middle-class white populations in Western countries. Refugee children with disabilities can have vastly different needs. At a Global Voice for Autism, we conduct ongoing quantitative and qualitative evaluations to understand what is and is not working. During the COVID-19 pandemic, this understanding allowed us to launch an emergency fund that anticipated the needs of autistic children and their families in these communities and impacted more than 12,000 individuals to mitigate the challenges they faced. Second, 
Think about who is not in the room and work out what you can do about it. As a foreigner, often working in communities with strict gender norms and significant disability stigma, I often find myself in conversations about local women and people with disabilities where these two populations are noticeably absent. When this occurs, I do everything in my power to bring those individuals into the room. And when that is not possible, I work to convey messages from them, share data, and do whatever I can to open up spaces where these communities feel permitted, valued, and comfortable enough to advocate for their own needs. If we all do this, then we will be building a more inclusive and equitable world for those with disabilities and beyond. Inclusion means all of us. Thank you.